Good evening and thank you all for joining us. Uh, tonight we are here with former Paralympic skier, the founder of multiple sporting charities and Deputy Lieutenant of London, Mike Brace, CBE. Welcome, Mike. Thank you very much indeed. Before we get chatting to Mike, there's a bit of housekeeping to run through with the audience. So some of you have sent through questions already in advance, so we'll be looking at those later. If you do want to send a question at any time through the webinar, please type them into the Q&A um, section of the webinar. The only cameras and microphones that are on for this webinar are my own and Mike's, so no one can see or hear anyone else that's watching. The session is being recorded and we will be put, putting it on the website afterwards. Okay, Mike, it's a pleasure to meet you and your story is pretty amazing. Um, and Monday, just gone, marks the 60th anniversary of you losing your sight. Do you want to tell us what happened that day? Yeah, I was playing football over the local common in Hackney where I was grow growing up. And I saw some kids uh, gathered around something at one end of the park. I went over and said, what are you doing? They told me to get lost. Uh, being a 10-year-old, slightly bolshy, I, I didn't I ignored them. Looked down on the floor and there was a black medicine bottle with the lid screwed on. And I thought, oh, I wonder what that's about. So I picked the bottle up just as the banger inside it blew up. So uh, I had badly scarred face and, and one eye and then ended up, uh, the good eye then developed a thing called uveitis and sympathetic ophthalmia. And the sight in that eye then went. And then when I was about 12, so 18 months, two years after the accident, I was trying to support my football team um, and was blowing a trumpet um, or a bugle or um, uh, anyway and basically uh, the pressure of blowing the trumpet then hemorrhaged the back of the eye and I then woke up uh, totally blind uh, age 12. Wow and how like what happened next in terms of that where where did your life go? Well it, it was a strange time really because um, I really focus on just trying to cope with getting used to not being able to see as much and then not being able to see at all. And my family then obviously had to adjust generally to suddenly having a, a youngster with a disability in the family. And all the cliches, you know, that that it was so amazing when you, you know, people think you can't hear as well as you can't see. And I remember getting on a bus with my mum um, and they would say, oh, poor little so-and-so. And I'd say to my mum, hello, who's got on the bus then that we're feeling sorry for today? And it turned out to be me. And in some ways that was a real good driving force for me because um, I, I resented fairly early on that sort of attitude and, and it resolved me to, to try and challenge that wherever I could and, and initially use sport as a, a vehicle to really put myself back together again, show myself what I could do, what my abilities still were rather than what my disability was. And that in turn then gave my family a bit of hope and challenged some of the uh, perceptions. And then on broader front, it, it, it gave me a chance to compete against my peers, many of whom were totally blind from birth and did things so naturally. So I wanted to be as good or better than them. So that was really spurred me on and the fourth area I suppose is the general public that they still had the attitudes of disability meant inability so again that was a red rag to a ball for me as a youngster so I wanted to show them uh, that I could do all sorts of things and so could my mates. And so now when you look at your kind of achievements so you've done six winter Paralympics three world champions and two European champions is that right? That's it. Um, yeah, in what sports? Tell us that about that. That all started in 1976. Um, I, 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 when I left school, there was just no sporting provision or limited sporting provision in the London area where I lived. We, we tried through a sports club that was around, but it was largely catering for uh, more pedestrian type sports like rambling and, and things like that. And we were all youngish Turks who had been at school, have done a whole range of uh, sports like uh, rowing and uh, athletics and uh, all, all that sort of stuff. So we wanted more lively activities. So rather than moaning about it, a few of us set up a sports club in London called Metro. Uh, eight of us put a fiver in um, to set the club going. And from there, 
um, it snowballed. So we got offers to do a range of different sports uh, uh, across uh, various uh, platforms. We did uh, surfing and water skiing and uh, abseiling and a bit of scuba diving. And we did shooting and we did archery. And then someone said, oh, had you ever thought about doing cross country skiing? And I said, you're joking. And uh, it was in Norway. So I got 15 of us to go over to Norway uh, in the mid 70s and try this uh, skiing. Um, it was cross country in, uh, as the first attempt, really. So it was uh, a bit flatter. You've not got the speed that the Alpine then has. Um, and I just loved it. The freedom of movement. You're not holding on to anyone. You're not um, you're out in the fresh air. And it was just unbelievably um, uh, you know liberating really and uh, I started to then go on a regular basis and then within two years they um, said that we're going to hold the first winter Paralympic Games uh, to be held in Sweden and those of us that had tried the cross-country skiing we were asked if we would trial to then represent Britain at those games and uh uh, two friends uh, from London and I both trialed and got in. A couple of guys from Scotland got in and there was a, an amputee uh, skier who was doing alpine skiing. He tried and got in. So the six of us then formed the first Winter Paralympic team uh, to represent Britain in 1976. So amazing. And I think as we enter kind of another lockdown, so many of us are just in awe of people that... Um, Kind of can get over kind of obstacles what do you think was your turning point in terms of yeah deciding that you were going to look positively on this i th i think luckily no one told me that i had a choice really um mm -hmm. you know as a youngster you're you're battling the next day and the next day i i you know i think it's much old much uh harder when you're older that you know a lot of your life is is based on your experiences and then suddenly you've got to you've got no experiences to draw on then to deal with life as someone that can't see. Whereas I was growing up adapting as a 10 or 12 or 15 year old to the different challenges that came through. And then I was able to adapt as someone that could see right the way through to then someone who couldn't see. And therefore you adjusted your, your uh, transition and the, and the things you did. And, and I, you know, it, I was lucky I had um, a supportive family at the time. I, um, you know, were, went off to work in the civil service, which I hated, because in those days it was very difficult. Um, when you were uh, vision impaired, and some of your, uh, some of the listeners, viewers will, will remember that, that you were often groomed, you were often told what you were fit to do. So if you were a, a been to some of the grammar schools, then you could possibly be a lawyer or a physiotherapist. And if you hadn't gone to those, you were likely to be an audio typist, a telephonist, a shorthand typist, or a piano tuner. And, and, and that was it. They were, they were really the only aspirations you could have. So you slotted into that. Um, and then I ended up working in the civil service and after a fortnight realised I was in the wrong job really because I, I wasn't very civil and I wasn't anyone's servant <laughs> and uh, and I suddenly thought well what are you going to do what are you going to change how are you going to change things uh, to to move on from that um, I'd, I'd started as I say setting up metro then we helped set up British Blind Sport then we set up the ski cup for the disabled so then suddenly thinking, well, look, it's not going to happen, you know, uh, by itself. That's why I then started to be involved with committee work and trusteeships, because I wanted to get some of those changes. Couldn't do it on my own. And if I could find like minded people to discuss these things with and organise these things with, then then we could take things forward and, and make it available to more people. Uh, and that and that was the driving force, really, that. That, that you had, I had the time in the civil service to, come, to devote to that. And then obviously I, I got my A-levels and did my studies and then went to study social work at uh, London Metropolitan. Okay, so you have set up so many bodies in terms of improving the sports provision for blind and partially sighted people. What kind of highlights do you have from, from doing that and from your career in doing that? I think, obviously, things like British Blind Sport was a, a, a big 
move forward because basically uh, there were good clubs around, but then starting to uh, make that a broader picture across the nation was, was, was obviously a, a big aim and objective. Um, we started the Metro Games and that again was a, a big move forward because previous to that, most of the um, organized uh, athletics events, for instance, were at Stoke Mandeville, largely focused for the physically disabled. And what we felt was that uh, a lot of the rules, a lot of the structure of the sports really weren't suited for blind and partially sighted. So rather than again moaning about it, what we decided was to set the Metro Games up in 1977. And then we held it on a proper running track. We had uh, officials, we had the, you know, um, I mean, in Stoke Mandeville, they didn't have a long jump pit. You jumped on grass for the long jump, which wasn't very safe and very ideal. Whereas then we started to use a proper long jump pit with run-ups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those sort of innovations really did start to show what was possible. And of course, it was at the time, again, when um, the uh, blind and partially sighted. The first Paralympics were held in 1960, formally in Rome, uh, but it wasn't till 1976 uh, for the Summer Games that they included athletes with uh, vision problems. And again, we were then at the forefront of trying to influence uh, both the selection, both the sports that were involved, and then obviously how we could then influence the whole uh, blind sporting uh, movement. Uh, and that all of those were really, really quite crucial at that early time. And then on a personal level, um, a lot of the funding that we needed for the sport really wasn't there. There was no lottery, there was no um, uh, organized sponsors. So coming up to the games in, um, in, the, uh, in the early eighties, we decided that uh, having seen the London Marathon, that perhaps that should be something we could do to raise money, uh, uh, the second or the third one. And we decided to do three marathons in 30 days in three different sports. Uh, and that then became our big fundraising platform. And that was pr probably the biggest challenge I've ever done um, in my life because the, the, the skiing marathon was fine. That was 42 kilometers in Norway. And that was, if you like, the easiest. Um, I wasn't particularly a runner, although I ran to get fit. And then someone said we should do the devices to Westminster Canoe Marathon. Um, and I thought, well, it's pretty easy as just sitting in a boat paddling. I didn't realize A, it was 125 miles and B, that there were 72 things called portages where you had to lift the canoe out hold it above your head, run round the obstacle, put it back in the water and carry on paddling. We're in a double canoe of whatever, 22 foot long and, and you're then doing it nonstop. Um, so 27 hours later, we finished the uh, canoe marathon and then a week after that, you, you've got to run the London Marathon. So for me, that was a massive challenge. But at the end of the day, I had to finish all three in order to get the money uh, to fund the team to go to the um, 1984 uh, Winter Paralympics. Mm. Well, so obviously you love sport and all kinds of sports. You've kind of thrown yourself into all of them. Um, what do you think the other benefits for people of, of engaging in sport? I, th I think it's it's really any form of recreation. I think, you know, um, uh, and I've got friends that basically are vision impaired, but basically not interested in the higher end competitive sport and sometimes almost feel resentful that people keep asking, well, aren't you a Paralympian or do that? But some form of exercise. I mean, I'm obviously getting on a bit now, but I've got a guide dog and we've been out um, walking around the block, keeping me fit and keeping the dog fit. And that for me is is the exercise the model really. It's just getting out and having that level of uh, exercise to keep the body and the, uh, and the mind uh, active. So it's not just the competitive end of it, it's just the whole benefits that feeling pretty healthy, pretty fit. Um, obviously a lot of people uh, becoming obese, especially in lockdown where yeah. um, exercise is, is more and more limited. But again, finding something to do that that starts to keep your, your body in trim. And the other big thing is, is, you know, what's worried me a little bit in the lockdown is 
one of the key elements is your lung capacity, your puff. So if, God forbid, that anyone does end up with any of the corona uh, symptoms, then having some sort of uh, healthy lung capacity because you've been doing a bit of exercise will stand you in good stead. Yeah, absolutely. In 2009, you got a CBE for your contributions to disabled sport. Do you want to talk about? Yeah, that was that was uh, that was quite a quite a surprise, really, because um, one of the one of the impacts of of being involved with uh, various sporting bodies and setting them up was that it then started to broaden you you started to be involved in a wider range of activities and as trustee week that we're, we're celebrating it gave me the confidence to to branch out really and to look at being involved in other areas not specifically then involving uh, sight loss or being focused on sight loss um, and that included a whole range of things. So uh, obviously setting up the Paralympic Association was one of those. And then as part of that, I then uh, was asked to be on the uh, bid team for London 2012 and then being on the organising committee of London 2012. And, and from there, really, everything snowballed. I've be, been involved then... Um, I was on the um, finance subcommittee. I was on various other things. So areas that were nothing to do with my sight loss, but were to do with building up of your experiences in other aspects of your life. So for me, that was just such a uh, a win win because it broadened out my horizons and 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 I think again broadened out um, the appeal of uh, or the knowledge then of other people because you could suddenly then uh, make a contribution that was slightly off, off centre from what they would normally expect. Um, so, that, so that was fantastic. And as I say, being then on the organising committee and being in Singapore when we won the bid, and it was just, uh, I, I thought I died and gone to heaven, quite <laughs> honestly. It was just, just unbelievable. Um, and it, it then linked in with a lot of the other things that I was doing. So... Um, from from being being involved with that, I got in contact with uh, one of the local universities, who then asked for me if I'd be uh, consider being on the board of governors of the university. And again, nothing to do with sight loss, but again, you could input on everything. I was on the estates committee, so you could look at access across the board. I was on their finance committee, so you were getting more skilled in terms of. Uh, financial management and issues and seeing it from a very um, different perspective and for me that was again the challenge you, you were doing things and contributing things on a, on a much wider uh, much wider platform um, and from there it asked they asked whether I'd um, consider help helping setting up the anti-doping agency for the UK in sport again nothing to do with disability but my experiences of Paralympic sport was obviously what they were drawing on. And of course, there are key issues to do with athletes with disabilities and aspects of uh, the anti-doping codes and, and practices that may affect the athletes differently with a disability. So you were able mm -hmm. to, to ensure that that breadth of knowledge was, was, was there at, at all stages. So for me, it, it was that continuum really. What was it like to meet the Queen? That was fantastic. I mean, <laughs> and it was really funny because um, she, uh, you know, you, you go through the protocol and you have your, your two minutes, you know, you're going to be there. I was, um, if you like, chaperoned by, I think, someone called the Page of the Presence. Um, and he was with me. And I had my London 2012 uh, badge on because it was... Uh, two bits to it. I, I actually had got the OBE in 2005 and that's the one the Queen presented and it was during the time of the, um, uh, the, 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 the IOC evaluation committee were due to be in London um, to evaluate our, our bids and stuff like that. So I had my um, London 2012 candidature pin on and the Queen then said, oh, um, you know, 
uh, oh yes, yeah, so that's right, you're with London 2012, uh, how's it going? And part of the um, part of the process was to take the IOC evaluation committee for a meeting of the, with the Queen at Buckingham Palace in the state dining room. And I then said, yeah, that's right, it's going very well. In fact, Mum, I'm having dinner with you tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and she th I, I meant must, the equerries must have thought I was slightly mad. So they were sort of <laughs> ushering me away rather quickly. And of course, the next night we were then having dinner. Uh, oh, which nice. was just amazing, just amazing. Yeah. Did you have to wear a gown? I, I had to wear my, a proper suit. And, <laughs> and again, that was interesting because they were going by boat and they were getting Tower London raised. And I don't know whether they were worried about me being on the boat and falling in or creating a problem. But they said, oh, we'd arrange for you to go by taxi to Buckingham Palace on your own. Um, or not on my own, but with someone else. And I said, oh, right. I was a bit miffed that, that I was suddenly going to be, uh, you know, shunted off on my own. And they said, so Steve Redgraves is going with you. So me and Steve were in wow. the in the car going off to Buckingham Palace, which was just surreal again with, uh, you know, someone of his uh, stature uh, and me. It was just, just brilliant. Amazing. So you've touched on some of the committees that you sit on and this week is National Trustee Week. Do you want to talk us through some of your trusteeships? Yeah, I, 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 it's, it's been interesting about um, where some of the linkages go because um, it, the, the, the um, confidence that I got from setting up Metro and, and the other committees and then I moved into um, management in my, my day job, which was in social work. So again, you were suddenly managing uh, groups of people and, and, and then time to take account of their needs. So uh, one of my management groups, I had a couple of managers with the hearing loss. I had someone else there that had other issues. And, and basically I'm suddenly a manager trying to enable others to participate fully in our management meetings and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So once you've had some of those experiences and then chairing Metro, et cetera, you were then, um, you know, really keen to perhaps bring some of your experiences to, to external bodies. So um, uh, as I said, I, I was on the uh, Sport Council Advisory Committee. Then I've been on a couple of um, IT type um, committees. I got asked because of my sporting links whether I'd consider being on the board of a small IT company, mainly um, web setting up websites. Um, and again, um, I now chair that as a, as a company uh, uh, called Nemesis. And, and, and that basically, uh, again, has been really rewarding because, you know, you're there for what you bring to the committee, not your disability. And, mm -hmm. and that, I think, has been really important. And, and what you found in so many cases, I remember going to the odd meeting where, um, you know, people would then put a paper round to be discussed at the meeting um, that wasn't in a format that I could access. And I said, no, you know, we shouldn't allow that, that, that you're excluding. I, I think I'm very quick on the uptake compared with some. Um, so I can read things fairly quickly and, and, and uh, glean the, you know, facts and stuff and then comment on it. But others are not necessarily that quick. So often what was happening is you spotted that people would circulate, um, you know, documents to get a decision really that wasn't then based on people's proper consideration of the of the paper. And so stopping people just doing that ad hoc was actually quite important. Or if they then did do a presentation, making sure that you had the slides in advance or they actually went through all of the slides uh, methodically and they could use that to let themselves know where they were in their talk or their presentation. But basically they then had to explain what it was they were showing to those of us that couldn't see. And that started, you know, a whole raft of, um, of change then on some of the, some of the groups that, that, I, that I was on. Um, and obviously technology then uh, came on being. I started to use computers in the mid 80s um, and that 
obviously was sooner than uh, earlier than some and therefore that gave me a bit of an advantage where you could get papers sent in a in a computer format or be able to read stuff during a meeting on a on a portable display with braille or whatever so so suddenly you were able to uh at least be on a par at times with with some of your fellow fellow trustees and and I think the issue there was very much about what you could then contribute. My, my life experiences, because of my disability, uh, are potentially different from, um, you know, someone next to me who hasn't got the same disability. And, and you were able then to, to really input in to say, whether it be access to shopping, um, whether it be access to websites, whether it be, you know, business imperatives uh, you could actually say well look, if you thought about this this actually may benefit this uh, whole of uh, being in the long run and, and add, add to more sales or better access or whatever yeah and you've touched on some of this but in terms of the organizations what would they say is the value of having you as a trustee oh you probably have to ask them actually um <laughs> it, 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 i think i think you know, um, I think because very often we do feel um, undervalued or or um, people focus on our disability and not our ability. I think the, 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 the issue is that you do put that extra effort in because basically you, you realise that you're in a potentially privileged position, if you like, in terms of being on a board, being on a, a committee, being on a, as a trustee and then being able to make a contribution based on you and your experiences and not if you like being seen as there as a token representative disabled person. Mm. Um, you know, and I think that that for me has been, you know, I've been for the odd interview and I said, look, if you're looking to appoint me as a disabled person for my disability, then I'm not interested and I'm sure you're not. I said, but if you're there, for what I can bring to it, then I do think I've got a lot to offer. And it does sound then a bit big headed or whatever, but it's not, that's not it, what it's about. It's about mm. saying, you know, why have I been so lucky? I mean, I've never been unemployed in the 40 odd years I was working, but the situation for many um, vision impaired people, I think 85% uh, are unemployed at any one time. And that figure hasn't changed in the last 50 years. So why, mm. why, why is it that, 85% of fellow uh, people with a vision impairment uh, aren't, aren't work, working or have never had a job. And, and I've been so lucky. And why can't we get that luck spread more um, uh, widely amongst the, uh, the vision impaired people that are looking for jobs now? And that's gonna get potentially worse with, with, with the coronavirus. Yeah. What would your advice be to anybody looking to, to kind of become a trustee of an organisation right now? I think, uh, be honest and, and evaluate what it is you're thinking you're bringing with you. So you're, you're, you've got knowledge, you've got experience linked to whatever the trusteeship you're looking for. So in my case, they were talking about anti-doping. So I, I brought a, a knowledge of me as a sportsman in terms of the issues that I faced in terms of uh, 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 anti-doping. If on the IT front, I brought the fact that access was a key issue and the, and the quicker it was for people to use, the better it was business-wise. So again, you were able to bring that type of perspective. Um, and, and so you're not really saying about your difference, but you're saying that my experience or your experience will be slightly different and therefore could benefit the, the, the whole in terms of taking that extra bit for, further forward. Absolutely. And all volunteering opportunities are about that mutual benefit. So we, we've kind of talked about the, the kind of benefits that like blind or partially sighted people can give to organisations. What do you think are the benefits that you can take from organisations by becoming a trustee? I think it. I think I've started to allude to it. Really, the, the you you end up growing your own skill base, your own knowledge base, because basically you you know you are being challenged to do certain things that you wouldn't normally have done. So, being on the finance committees, I I then had to learn how to read spreadsheets more effectively as a vision impaired person using 
whatever technology that's available. I had to ensure that I um, did read things thoroughly and, and rather than skim read them so that I could know that confident that, I, that my abilities were there and my knowledge base was sound when you're then challenging a view. And the other interesting thing which I found, which I, for me was a real um, move forward was, you know, um, and again, people's experience differ, but as a someone, young person with a disability, you know, people were reluctant to challenge my views and perceptions and uh, because I was disabled, you know, and somehow that's not quite, quite nice. Um, or you, I would then put forward a view that wasn't really my view. It was what I'd picked up on the radio or the telly that was a, a consensus view of someone else. And I hadn't really thought through what my view of the world was or my view of the situation was. So I, I, I slightly then, you know, you would, would be seen to be putting the BBC perspective. And suddenly you're on committees where you were being challenged. You, you know, people would say, what you're saying is absolute garbage. You know, that, <laughs> that's really rubbish or you haven't thought that through. And then you suddenly have to argue your case and listen to the case. And you had a proper debate and a proper challenge to, to your thinking. And, mm -hmm. and that is, it, for me, was so empowering as well as yeah. a challenge. You know, and I think that's what trustees and committees do. You're not there to all agree all the time. And you're there certainly at times to give the, the staff in the organisation. And I hope no one from but Thomas Poplings is listening to this or as your management. But you are there to, to look and give the staff a bit of a, a guidance, but, but also challenge their perceptions and their thinking to make sure that you get the best for the organisation. And, and, and that I think is, is a quite, quite challenging, but also quite empowering for, for the individual. I think there are a few listening, but it's fine. You're OK. <laughs> so how did you um, find out about your trusteeships? If somebody's looking to become a trustee, how do they go about finding out what the opportunities are? Well, there are, there are um, uh, depending on where, where it is. So some of the sporting bodies, um, uh, you can log on onto their websites and ask to be notified. Some of the charities, um, then would also send out um, uh, emails uh, or put it on notice boards. The government uh, website, um, they um, have um, one where they advertise government committees um, and, and standing bodies. Um, so one of my committees, I'm on the Department of Transport's uh, Transport Advisory Committee for people with a disability. And I got that through the um, notice board from the government uh, website. They, they then send you announcements of uh, bodies or organisations that are looking for trustees or directors um, uh, in the areas that you've specified that you might be interested in. And some of that is geographical or that will tell you where the, where the bodies are. So some of them are in Scotland or Northern Ireland or London or wherever or uh, are roaming. So, so that's another site. So I still get stuff. Uh, through from that to say, are you interested? This is a, a vacancy that's that's come up. Um, okay. <laughs> and, and if you got particular areas of interest, you could then certainly contact those bodies and say you are interested as as and when vacancies arise, could they could they contact you? Um, yeah, great. And I think LinkedIn now more than ever is being used to advertise. Yes. It is as yes. Well. It's a social media. Lovely. OK, so we've had quite a lot of um, really good questions. So we're going to go to some of the questions. Mm -hmm. um, Penny, are you going to come on or do you want me to read them? <clears throat> no, I've got uh, I've got the questions here. So uh, we've had uh, quite a few questions coming in. And, um, and if anyone thinks of other questions, it's not too late. So you can put them in the, in the Q&A box. So um, the one I particularly like is um, there's been some outrageous fashion disasters worn during skiing competitions. Have you been able to avoid um, uh, such fashion faux pas? No, no, definitely <laughs> not. Um, I, 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 I've had all sorts of things. In, in the cross-country ski gear, you often then ended up with very skin-hugging lycra suits <laughs> that were micro 
um, small, but also multi, 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 multi colored. They were really, you know, 30, 40 things. Um, and I remember losing my luggage in America um, and my wife and I went into a store with the 50 pound that the airline gave us for losing our luggage. And, and of course I had to get some ski equipment, ski gear to go with my skis that I had still got with me. And I went in and, uh, and my wife said, no, there's virtually nothing that's available. Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you mean virtually nothing? When she said, there's one ski suit. She said, <laughs> it is the most revolting I've ever seen in my life. It sort of <laughs> looks as though someone's been ill down the front in tech. <laughs> and, and I said, how much? She said, $40. And I said, well, that, that's what yeah, we can right. afford. When I bought it and the uh, assistant then went into fits of laughter. <laughs> And I said, what are you laughing at? And he said, well, I said, we've got a saying in this store, this has been reduced from $200 down to $40. And the thing in the store we've said is, this is so awful. The only person that would ever consider buying it is a blind man <laughs> and you've just bought it. So, so that, that was certainly one of them. And the other one was we, in the first games, we were given these plastic uh, shell suits I don't know if you remember those but these these plastic shell yeah. suits and they <laughs> didn't breathe they had no Gore-Tex or anything in them to <laughs> allow and you felt like a jungle fresh peanut in these things because you just <laughs> dripped um, as, as you were exercising and and we just wandered around in these shell suits all the time so we did look <laughs> a bit like a, an orphanage or something you know sort of uh, poor relations. Good. Um, <laughs> we did have a question that came in before the webinar um, by email and it said if you had to give three pointers to sports coaches and supporters to encourage participation what would they be? I think the coaches really do need to not necessarily understand all of the levels of the disability but to have that open-mindedness if someone really is interested in doing a particular sport or an activity there usually is a way around most things. So most of the enablers that I've met in my life have been just fantastic. You know, I've, I've come up with mad ideas and I've always then found someone even madder than me to actually put them into practice, <laughs> whether it be, you know, piloting a glider or um, water skiing or abseiling or whatever. And therefore the, the coaches, if they can start to think outside the box, speak to the individual to find out the sorts of things that they need and then ask others, you know, because there are people out there that can come up with suggestions. The second thing I think is the suitability of, of the areas. And so many areas, you know, look at just the, the running track and how good that is. But it basically you've got changing rooms, you've got other facilities, cafes or whatever. And so often, um, that isn't thought about, uh, about how accessible or useful they are. And certainly with people in the vision impairment, you know, um, if you want to go into the cafe afterwards and you've got a brown floor with a brown table and you get a brown tray, there's no way you're going to be able to distinguish the difference. So something around colour contrast or lighting is just something fairly easy. And then the third thing is looking at what the enabling factors are. So the guide runners that, that are now available for park runs etc there's more and more available out there that, that that can then tip the balance so whether it be a buddy during um, a, a gym exercise or a, a gym that was willing to uh, set the equipment up for you if it's not accessible so it's those sorts of flexibility bits that you you want to try and sort of build into the equation okay great um, the, the questions are coming in as well. So, um, okay, so um, do you feel there is a particular dynamic for VI blind sport for people with acquired vision loss? Yeah, I think I think it is. It is. I think it's different. I, th I think the problem is that when, like, like when I w uh, was able to see. I play football, I did various things, and suddenly you've got to do it very differently because you can't see. And, and for me, that is the issue about the acquired loss is that you're almost having to unlearn how you've done it before and then relearn it to do it uh, slightly differently. Whereas someone that's never had 
uh, site or, or had, had a level of site that's been fairly consistent, what you've done is you're, you're learning to do it almost for the first time and then continue and hopefully get better at it. So I, I think there is a difference, but I think it is, it's not, um, uh, you know, you can actually deal with it, but it do, does and may take longer. Um, and, and certainly I, I, you know, I am, um, were amazed, was amazed at the skill level of some of my colleagues who um, had sight loss from birth or whatever. And they did things just so naturally um, that I then would struggle to, to achieve. Uh, but that was the challenge then, because you wanted to be as good as they uh, were. Um, and, and, and that was part of the, uh, the challenge to take up. Okay, um, there's a great question here in terms of, uh, did you ever feel overwhelmed between life and committee work life and want or need to step back from something? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I, th I think luckily for me, there were very few situations of that. I, you know, sport and, and being on committees has always been a voluntary activity. It's, it's, it's not, there have not been jobs, if you like. So there have always been things that I've put myself forward to do because I've either believed in them or wanted to do. And at times uh, that, that could be overwhelming and could really, um, you know, threaten uh, your, your peace of mind, really, because you were so busy. But in many ways, um, when I found uh, when I retired was the reverse of that, that I suddenly realised that all I've been doing on the committees and the sport and everything were my hobbies. And suddenly when I retired and was then on the committees, I, I felt really quite um, bereft, really, because I didn't really have a focus. I didn't really have that things to do. I always had 100 things to do and managed to do 20. And suddenly you're going to have 10 things to do, of which you could do virtually all of them. So, again, that's when I um, started. I, I wrote a, a second book because basically, A, I had the time to fill, and B, I thought, well, what, what am I going to do with this time and what could I usefully, um, you know, have as the next challenge, really? Okay, great. I've got a lovely question here from Felicity Six and Olivia Nine, who would like to ask you what you ate for dinner with the Queen. Um, oh, that was, that was, <laughs> uh, I was really worried about scratching the plates because they were about a thousand pounds, these uh, china plates that we were on. And we had um, a, a sort of very thin starter. And what you have on these posh dinners is not a lot of it. It's very nice, but it's not a lot of it. And if you can't see where it is on the plate, I, I was going round and round thinking, well, I haven't put anything on the plate yet. And then suddenly found this pimple in the middle of the plate that was the, uh, the starter. So we had, um, yeah, we had a starter and we had a, um, I think it was some form of, of pheasant or duck and then um, as, or, or some venison, I think was the other option you could have or a vegetarian and then a, a, a pudding and then uh, cheese and biscuits. And uh, I must admit, I did have a glass of port that was probably um, <laughs> hundreds of pounds, just one glass, but uh, that was that was my dinner. Oh, very good. And, and another food related, obviously people, <laughs> they time, so obviously people are thinking about their tea. So I've had another question in, say, if you were to arrange a meal for a wedding, what would you avoid putting on the menu? What avoid putting on the menu for a wedding? Um, uh, the only, luckily being an athlete, you eat whenever you can. You do try and ensure that it is a proper, you know, a proper diet. Um, so lots of it, but lots of the right stuff. Um, so carbs and things like that. So that's what I would do. What I wouldn't put on the, the menu is the only thing really that I, I don't like eating is celery. Um, my wife and I both got ill after a, uh, a meal once where we think the celery was the thing that wasn't necessarily made us ill but was what made us think we were uh, ill because of that and we've neither have been able to neither of us have been able to, to ever take celery since then so uh, it wouldn't be celery on there um and it would be probably for me 
um, you know, a nice bit of um, meat with some uh, good, good quality veg uh, to give you a bit of uh, protein, but also the carbohydrates. What about good decorations, Mike? Sorry? What about the plastic decorations? Uh, oh, yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, I mean, luckily, I mean, I've had <laughs> things like... Um, uh, do you remember in the cornflakes they used to have the little plastic uh, <laughs> gifts and I've ate those and uh, and various other things dropping in your dinner and um, um, and I wouldn't use candlelit uh, either I've had a few bad experiences of candlelit dinners so uh, that would be the other thing I'd avoid I took a girl out when I was 17 um, uh, in Notting Hill Gate and um, you know, was fancying my chances of perhaps moving things forward with our relationship and everything else. And uh, um, she asked for a serviette, which I passed her, not realising the, um, the candle was on the table. And the serviette caught light and the waiter had to then put the fire out with the water bucket. And the girl <laughs> didn't go out with me after that. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> wow, it's her loss. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so there's a very serious question from someone here. It's obviously thinking about, um, you know, encouraging more trustees. So how do you think charities can engage a more diverse representation of trustees? I, I think firstly, they've got to have an open mind. A, a diversity is, is important, but they've got to know why, you know, just, I mean, women have had the same issues over the last year. You know, being a woman on a board isn't isn't the issue. In the same as being disabled isn't uh, the issue. It's what you bring uh, to the to the table, and it's your experiences, your knowledge, um, uh, and your inputs. And I think that's what the committees often need to to do. And what's happened to make life slightly more difficult is that. Um, a lot of boards now, quite right, they're looking for particular skills that are, that are now skill-based boards. So instead of just being representatives, it's actually people with HR skills or um, finance or whatever. And because, you know, fewer and fewer people have had those experiences, certainly with a disability, then basically they are going to struggle slightly more to fill those particular gaps in, in a skill-based trustee board. So think long and hard about how you can adapt what your skill base is to meet those particular needs. I mean, most of us deal with money on a day to day basis. You may not have been a financial director of a company, but you're managing money. So it's about thinking that through and saying, OK, well, I manage my own money. I manage perhaps my family's money or whatever. And therefore, the principles are very much the same. How do you keep count of it? How do you know what you're spending? How do you know what your income is? Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the rules are basically the same. It's just how you can apply it from your experience onto, on, onto the trustee board that are looking for those particular skills or those particular um, individuals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, we've got a question in saying, what is your proudest achievement to date? Oh, um, I think the proudest in terms of challenge was the triple marathon. I think I think it, it taught me so much about myself uh, that I I think I understood. But you know, when you get to um, the level of, of of tiredness and and complete and utter exhaustion that I got to, and then two stages beyond that then you do learn a lot about your, your resolve, your self-determination and, and, and some of your inner, inner feelings and inner fears. Um, I think so, I, say, I, I think from, from that perspective, that was, I was proud in terms of doing that and, and, and achieving it and, and fulfilling it. I think, I, think, um, I think apart from that, I would say, um, I would say, some of the organizations that I mm. helped set up, um, the contribution they're now making to um, other people's lives is, is, is going and growing. And I think, I think that's just something, almost like a legacy, that there are more people now having those opportunities uh, that didn't exist 30 and 40 years ago. And that's largely through those organizations 
uh, that are that are taking some of those issues forward. You know, um, and and I think that that's been quite important. Okay, great. Um, I had such a we've had quite a few nice comments through. Um, I just read one from uh, Denise who said, "Not a question, but Mike is so engaging. Always, I always enjoy listening to him. Full of knowledge." such a lot of life experience and a great sense of humor. I think we could all um, agree with that. So uh, yeah. that's a nice comment. Oh, um, that's very nice. Thank you, Denise. Nice. Uh, someone has mentioned a story about using a mop as a mo mobility aid. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, that, that again, um, yeah, I can, I can hear what some of the people are coming on that. Basically, um, I've got to be careful I say this, I, I might, might be then um, regarded as a bit of a vandal, but um, many, many years ago, I used to use a cymbal cane. Um, and uh, I, when I was in Nottingham Gate, you could run down onto the platform and as the doors or the train was sh shutting, you could then stick your stick in the door and the door would open and then you could get on the tube. Right now, I don't advocate this, so, you know, mustn't do this and everything else. But I did this one day and I ran down onto the platform, the train was, doors were shut, I stuck my stick in and the door shut and unfortunately they didn't reopen. And um, most of you know that the, the st white sticks have got like four little metal tubes with elastic in the middle. And of course the, the uh, stick then started to expand on the elastic as the train left the station. and it got to about 10 foot and I had to let go. So the train then went off with my white stick dangling down outside the train. And I'm on the platform then thinking, well, I've got to get home. And, a, and, a, and one of the staff came and I thought he was going to have a heart attack because he was in a terrible state. He said, oh, you have a white stick. I said, oh, well, I'm fine, I'm fine. I said, have you got access to your broom cupboards? And he said, yeah. I said, well, do us a favor, go and break the broom handle off the head and give me the broom handle and I could use that as a white stick. So we, we came down onto the platform and I got me broom handle when he was going to put me on the next train. And I've suddenly started going to fits of laughter and the bloke said, what, what are you laughing at? And I said, oh, I've just had a thought. I said, I'm all right here. I've got me broom handle. I can use that. I said, but can you imagine the next station? The train pulls in, the doors open and a white stick drops out and everyone's looking for the blind man under the train who's not on the other end of the truck of the stick. So, yeah, so that was, um, yeah, that was quite an experience. That's hilarious. That's so good. Um, so can you pinpoint a particular memory from sports participation or competition that you'll cherish forever? Particular memory? Um, I... Yeah, I think I've had uh, I've had a few. I mean, skiing uh, with a friend of mine in Norway, um, and you're out in the in the wilds. There is no sound because you're above the the, the bird line and things like that. And it was very close to a spiritual uh, sensation that you got virtually no sound whatsoever, other than you and your skis. You're in the sunshine, you're doing something um, physical. And uh, at times I, I almost got emotional because you're just so, you, you were just out in the, in the wild. You could have been the last two people on, on, on earth because you know the, it, it, you just didn't hear any sounds, which is quite rare if you live in London, that there's no sound at all. But on the top of this mountain with uh, the sun shining and, and almost total silence was just, just unbelievably, um, memorable and it's something you know that stuck with me uh forever on that and i think the other um the other uh, side of that is um some of the fun i've had with with the teams with the teams uh, uh, abroad with the, the, the you know the emotional moments of leading the the team of uh of paralympic athletes at, at the paralympic games and and standing there and thinking, this is the team that I've helped to um, get to here, and 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 being part of that was just um, was just you know, pretty overwhelming. And then you know, sitting in a in in Buckingham Palace, really, with the Queen and um, having dinner, uh, and thinking, you know, this this is so surreal, really, that away from the East End, um, you know. 
um, wouldn't necessarily have had this as a, a, a project um, in the future as a 10 year old in, in Hackney, suddenly sitting, having dinner with the Queen and uh, chatting with her and Prince Philip and Princess Anne obviously was on the bid committee. That was the other one, one other memory. Uh, Princess Anne was on the bid committee with me and we came out um, uh, of the room where we were having the committee meetings and Princess Anne then said to me, um, um, would you like a coffee? And I said, well, yeah, I, I would. I said, mum, but I obviously can't possibly uh, ask you to get it. And she said, us royals should be useful for something, she said. So, uh, <laughs> off, and so she became my tea lady, you know. And I, I just thought she was so wonderful. And, uh, you know, and that was just so amazing, really. That, that mm -hmm. sort of experience that you just wow. couldn't really put a price on. I'm not sure you can beat that. That's no, just... it's amazing. <laughs> I've got some great, some uh, more great questions. Um, yep. Time for everything, but this is a really good, good one. So, <clears throat> I'm a chairperson of a blind sports committee. Um, we've needed to make a new start recently, or fresh start recently, with a new committee. Um, we're all young VI people. Do you have any advice for us? And other than um, British Blind Sport, are there other organisations, people that can help sports clubs? We're based in Wales. I think if they made contact with um, uh, Metro Sports Club, because they set up the sports club um, and a number of us are still obviously feeding into that. And they would have so much um, information about how they do it. They've got a committee, they've got the subgroups, they've got the small subgroups within that. Um, so they would be a good contact. So a fellow minded, a like minded um, body that already exists. Um, there are various it depends on the sports as well. So if you were doing particular sports, a number of the um, sports bodies have got uh, particular advisors on um, uh, on the on how to set up those sports or how best to get coaching, etc., on, on a local basis. Um, and there is uh, certainly was a Welsh Disability Sports Council, so the, you should be able to go into them to to get their uh, advice and information. And again, the Paralympic Association have got um, a various things like Parasport website that's got uh, wh where certain facilities are operating across different areas. Um, so, so there are a few places out there, but again, sports bodies, depending on the sport, other sports clubs are doing it on a broader basis. So they could certainly feed into that. Um, and, and I'm sure they would be more than happy to help and advise and then obviously you've still got bridge blind sport and, and and some of the other bodies that that could help great we've got two minutes to go so okay. I'll, I'll just ask one last question um, the person says it's been really fantastic to listen to your stories and hear all about your amazing achievements this evening what does 2021 have in store for you oh um i think for me i i the, the the two, two books that I've done have been about my experiences and, and uh, trying to bring a bit of humour because that's partly what it's about. Getting people to laugh at their attitudes to disability is hopefully what I do through the after dinner speaking and, and the books. And so 2021, I'm hoping that I will carry on doing the after dinner stuff. I do three different talks so that you've got three chances of, uh, of, of going to different audiences. I flogged the books through that as well. And I'm looking at probably trying to do a third book. I've got a, a new guide dog called King, who's just come in and uh, trying to get my attention. Um, <laughs> and so I'm thinking of doing a third book called The King and I. Um, oh. And I'm going to try and then uh, do a bit of a humorous thing mm -hmm. from his perspective and my perspective about our new partnership. So a bit of writing um, and a few more... Um, uh, activities in terms of the after dinner stuff, I think. Lovely. Are we going to wrap up? Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's been so much fun. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I think by the amount of questions, everybody's been so engaged by tonight. We could have probably gone on for another hour, but it is the eve of lockdown. So I'm sure people have other things that they wanted to kind of do, but it has been fantastic. You can always do an after dinner speech for us 
and, and our stuff. So we'll, we'll sign you up for that before you leave. <laughs> no problem whatsoever. And again, once lockdowns happen, anyone else um, wants any help, then contact us. You know, they Aww. can get the details and uh, I'll see if I can help. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you so much. You've really great pleasure. a fascinating person to speak to. So, yeah, thank you. Great pleasure. Good night, everyone. Yeah, enjoy your eve of lockdown.